Well, several years ago, Chelsea and I had the wonderful opportunity of leading worship and participating in a missions conference in a remote island in the Bahamas. Now, I know what you're saying. Tell me where there's a missions conference in the Bahamas and sign me up. We had a wonderful, wonderful time uh, at this sweet and beautiful little church in the, uh, in the Bahamas. It's, it's a quiet place. It is free from the trappings of many vacation and resort communities. There are no resorts there, no cars, uh, n- no big activities. Uh, if you want to get anywhere on the island, you either walk or ride a golf cart. You can't get to it by car or plane. You have to ride a boat, a ferry into the island. It is a perfect little remote place. Uh, and it is an island of boats. It's a boat makers, sailors, marinas. There are boats everywhere. And for someone like me who loves boats, uh, it is a perfect paradise. Uh, I, have, I have grown up loving boats, riding on boats, jet skiing, uh, skiing on the boats, tubing on boats. I love boats, but I've never had the opportunity to sail on a sailboat. That, that's not something you do in East Tennessee, but it has always fascinated me. So outside of us suffering for the Lord at this missions conference in the Bahamas, um, I made a friend who had a sailboat, and he invited us out on his boat one day to to have a little sailing excursion. Of course, I jumped at the opportunity. But not only did I jump at the opportunity, I thought, you know, I need to research a little bit about uh, how to sail a boat. So I Googled and started reading uh, up on all that goes into uh, being on a sailboat and how you sail a boat and all the particulars. And And when the day came, man, I was ready to go. I put on the right clothes. I had the right shoes. We packed the bag. Chelsea took a Dramamine. We were ready to go on our sailing excursion. Well, I certainly realized as I got onto that boat, there's a whole lot more to a sailboat than the little Google article I read a day ago. And we were out on the water. We were on a 42-foot sloop. We were sailing out of the harbor into the Sea of Abaco, and all was perfect. All was wonderful. The weather was serene. And then the captain of the boat, his name was Kirk, he invited me to take over the wheel and begin to sail the boat. And all of a sudden, all of the pride, all of the adrenaline, all of the, all of the factoids that I had gathered from Google, all of that flew out of the window. And all of a sudden, I realized I'm in charge of a 42-foot sailboat in the middle of the open waters in the Sea of Abaco. This is a little bit uh, scary. This, this is a little more than I think I'm prepared for. Reality hit me as a wave crashed up over the side of the boat and the sea spray was in my eyes and I realized there is a lot going on here. Whether when to hoist the sail, when to start the engine, whether or not you're getting in shallow water and running could run aboard or run into rocks. All of these things, depths and and, and which way the wind is blowing, all of these things are decisions that are being made. Well, I think everybody that was on the boat kind of realized that I was panicking a bit. And as soon as, as, uh, as the, the, the captain kind of saw that I was melting down in that seat of that sailboat, he calmly reassured me with his voice, don't worry, I'm here. And he took over the wheel for me. As I went below deck to get some lemonade, I looked on the wall there in the galley and and saw on the wall all kinds of plaques and certificates and licenses and photographs of sailing excursion and recognized that the captain of this boat, he knew what he was doing. He had experience. He had mastered uh, all of the drills and the proficiencies needed to manage a sailing vessel at that size. He was skilled. My anxiety when I was behind the wheel subsided when I allowed the captain to be in his rightful seat. And focusing on him calmed my fear of the unknown 
and the overwhelmment of being in a seat that I really didn't belong in. Well, it was an exhilarating and horrifying experience all at the same time. And as I thought about that day, my mind went to a familiar story found in Matthew chapter 14. Peter and the disciples had a very similar experience. Now, trade a 42-foot sailboat used for, uh, j for, for just uh, pleasure and entertainment in the Sea of Abaco for a fishing boat in the middle of a storm-tossed Sea of Galilee. And as we focus on three important words in Matthew chapter 14, verse 27 through 29, I want us to be reminded of these words of Jesus. I am here. I am here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 14 as we read th these three verses together. Verse 27 says, But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Notice verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Well, Jesus had just fed the 5,000 early in, in, in Matthew chapter 14. Jesus had fed the 5,000. As the crowds were departing from, from the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus went into the hills to pray and the disciples got in the fishing boat and launched out into the Sea of Galilee. And as they did, they would quickly find that they'd got themselves in quite the predicament. Now, the Sea of Galilee is only 13 miles at its longest point and seven and a half miles at its widest. It is small, but it certainly can be very turbulent and it can be, become unhinged very quickly. Because of its size, the Sea of Galilee is more prone to the winds that howl over the Golan Heights. And the fast shifting winds make the waves and the storms even more severe. In the winter months, Storms can happen every two weeks or so, disturbing the waters for two and three days at a time. It can become a very volatile situation very quickly. And the disciples knew that they were in trouble when what should have been a very quick trip became a battle of survival into the wee hours of the morning. The sun had long set, the rains were pounding the boat, the winds howling about them, the waves crashing, lightning and thunder illuminating and blowing up the night sky. And we read in Matthew chapter 14, verse 24, Matthew writes, Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. They were in trouble. They were in trouble. They were fighting against the elements. And maybe that's a phrase that would describe where you are in your life tonight. Maybe you are in the middle of a divorce and you are tossed about by the waves of guilt. Maybe you're in the middle of a job loss, tossed about by the feelings of inadequacy. Maybe you're in the middle of debt tonight and you are tossed about by the waves of creditors. In the middle of inflation, tossed about by ever-changing lifestyles and budgets. In the middle of a health crisis tossed about by the waves of doctor's appointments and lab results. And in Matthew chapter 14, verse 26, their night of fighting the storm begins to get even worse, or so they think. Because in verse 26 of Matthew chapter 14, we read that when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. And in their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. Surely the disciples must have been thinking, if the waves and the wind won't take us under, surely this apparition is going to be our end. This ghost has come to claim our very lives. They were completely handicapped 
paralyzed, frozen in fear. Yet, Jesus responds to their fear with a calming and eternal reminder. And it's the verse we began with, Matthew chapter 14, verse 27. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, he said. I love how the New Living puts this. Take courage, I am here. I am here. What comforting words of Jesus to know I am here. Jesus is here. And that brings me to my first point tonight. Jesus is present. Jesus is present. You know, no matter the storm, no matter the situation, no matter the hour, no matter the circumstance, you can count on this truth. If you are a believer, Jesus is present in your life. Jesus said it. I am here. Don't be afraid. I am here. The disciples were certain it was a ghost. They were certain their lives were about to be over. They were certain that their deepest fears were going to come to pass. But the very thing they should have been certain of, they were uncertain. Jesus was absent and they didn't recognize him. Jesus, the person who they had been following, Jesus, the one who they had seen do miracles, Jesus, the one that they had committed their life and service to, they did not recognize in the midst of the storm. Their focus was off. Fear had confused their sensibilities. It had blurred their vision. It had diminished their thinking. They confused Jesus for a ghost. But they not only confused him, but they underestimated his power. Stop to think about it. The disciples had just seen Jesus take a little boy's lunch and feed 5,000 people. A little sack lunch had fed 5,000 people with basketfuls left over, but they didn't stop to think that Jesus had the power to calm the storm. Now, it's easy to beat up on these disciples, isn't it? Um, we like to be backseat drivers or sideline coaches often. But however, the sad truth is, this is a regular occurrence in our own lives, isn't it? In the midst of fear, in the midst of a storm, we easily forget the power and the presence of God. We forget that Jesus is present in our lives. We forget that the power that he has and the things that he has done, Jesus being the same yesterday, today, and forever, we forget of what he can do. We underestimate his power and we forget that we have his presence in our lives. You know, Paul reminds us over in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5, talking about the Lord's return. He says these words, Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. It's a reminder to not fret the storm because Jesus is coming back. I am here. Jesus is coming back. And maybe you're, you're there tonight in the midst of a storm in your life and you just need to remind it. One day, this is all going to come to an end. Jesus is going to return. I am here. I am coming. The Lord is near. John, in verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 20 he says this, on that day you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I in you. It's a call to not worry about the isolation and loneliness of the storm. The Holy Spirit indwells the believer. We are one with Christ. We are in Christ and he is in us. It is like him saying, I am here. I am here. I am with you. He's coming back. He lives within us. But then, and the Great Commission, over in Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 20, Jesus talking, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. It's another reminder that the Lord's very presence is with us until the end of time. I am with you. I am in you. I am coming back for you. Jesus is present. John 10 verse 28 reminds us that we can't be snatched from the hand of God. Romans 8 38, Paul reminds us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Death, life, angels, demons, fears of today, worries about tomorrow, not even the very power of hell itself can separate us or pry us from the love of God. 
So through all of these reminders throughout Scripture, the Lord is coming for us. The Lord is in us. The Lord is with us. No one can take us from his hand. No one can separate us from his love. There is nowhere that we can go that God is not. There is not a day that will ever dawn when God ceases to be. Look over your shoulder. That is God following after you. Look into the storm in front of you and Jesus is present running toward you. Jesus is presence. He said to the disciples, I am here. And wherever you are tonight and whatever is going on in your life, I want you to pause and listen to the voice of the Lord Jesus saying to you, I am here. I am here. Jesus is present. But not only is Jesus present, second tonight, I want you to notice we've got to stay focused on Jesus. We've got to stay focused on Jesus. Now, most of us are familiar with this portion of, of this biblical story. The disciples now recognizing Jesus after he told them who he was, they thought he was a ghost. Now they, now they know it's Jesus. He says, it is I, be not afraid. I am here. And verse 28 and 29, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, some have argued that Peter may have never made this request to Jesus to walk on the water if the, if the sea was calm, if the storm was not brewing. It, it may have been applauded or thought impressive, but it would not have compelled Peter to lunge over the side of the boat and start walking started walking to Jesus. Storms prompt us to take unplanned and indescribable journeys. There are probably many of you, if you were able to testify tonight, that would say when a storm came into your life, you went on a remarkable, unprecedented, unplanned, indescribable journey with the Lord. Peter jumped out of the boat and he did what was impossible. And my mind for all of these years, when I read this story and I think about this story, I, I always go, what must have been going on in Peter's mind? Did he just want to get to Jesus? Did he think Jesus was his safety net, so he just wanted to run to him? Did he want the experience of walking on the waters? What propelled him to jump out of the boat and walk on the water? I don't know. That probably wouldn't have been the thing that I would have wanted to do. But Peter made history. In a few exhilarating, mind-blowing seconds, Peter did the indescribable. He jumped out of the boat and walked on the water, on top of the water, to Jesus. But we're critical of Peter, aren't we? Because we know what happens. We know the rest of the story. It didn't take long for Peter to divert his attention from Jesus to the events happening around him. The wall of water raging around him, the lightning overhead, the wind gusting every direction. Peter shifted his attention from Jesus and toward the storm. And when he did, he sank like a boulder thrown into a pond. He was going down. Peter shifted his attention from Jesus and toward the storm. And when he did, he started going down. He was going under. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 30, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Help me, I am sinking. When we put our attention on the storm around us, rather than the Savior within us, we too will be like Peter and begin to sink. The crisis and the chaos around us, it's always noisy, it's always loud, it's always fleshy, flashy, it always begs for our attention and strives to capture our gaze, but Jesus is always right there in front of us, present, here, ready to help us. And we must stay focused on him. We must focus our attention on Jesus rather than the storm. <coughs> 
when we focus on Jesus, our problems keep their right priority. When we stay focused on Jesus, pain stays in its perspective. Depression does not give way to defeat and despair does not destroy us. We can stay focused on Jesus. That is not to say that the storm ceases. That does not say that the storm doesn't exist. That simply reminds us that we keep the storm in perspective that Jesus is still the peace speaker. Jesus is still the source of our strength and the strength of our life. We must stay focused on Jesus. We can't choose whether or not the storms come into our life, but we can choose where we focus our attention, the storm or the Savior. We're never going to get an option on whether or not things are allowed into our lives. We're not going to ever get to choose the challenges with our health or the storms that blow by winds of adversity into our life. But we can choose to focus on the Savior. So we see that Jesus is present. We are reminded to stay focused on Jesus but tonight, thirdly, I want us to remember we must surrender to the Lord's help. We must surrender to the Lord's help. Peter cries in verse 30 of Matthew 14, Lord, save me. There are two phrases that are uttered here in Matthew chapter 14 in this passage we've read tonight and are studying tonight that I think are so powerful. Jesus said, I am here. And the second one, Peter said, Lord, save me. They go hand in hand in a way. Jesus is present. He is here. I'm here. And when we surrender to the Lord's help, <coughs> it is the peace that passes all understanding that follows. Jesus did save Peter. Jesus, Jesus came to his rescue. Peter cries out, Lord, save me. And in verse 31, Jesus asked him, Peter, why did you even doubt me? O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt me? In verse 32 of Matthew 14, Jesus gets him back to the boat, gets him back inside the boat, and the scripture says the winds ceased. The storm ceased. <clears throat> we must be courageous enough to admit our inadequacies and surrender to the Lord's help. You know, for years, whether it be in Sunday school or sermons, I've heard Peter get beat up on. Oh, he took his focus off of Jesus. He got scared. He got afraid. He started looking at the winds and the waves around him, and he took his eyes off of Jesus, and he sank. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And that is true. We do need to keep our eyes on Jesus. That is the place to focus. But let's face reality. Sometimes it's hard not to look at the winds and the circumstances around us. Sometimes it's hard not to be overwhelmed and to falter and to fail and not keep our eyes exclusively on Jesus. And we find ourselves sinking just like Peter did. But I applaud Peter that while he began to sink, while he took his focus off of Jesus, when he was going down, he knew where to turn. He knew where to turn. We have to be willing to admit our inadequacies and surrender to the Lord's help. We must recognize, friends, we cannot save and help ourselves. We cannot face the storms of life alone. We cannot manage the crushing blows of life flying solo. We must be willing to cry out just like Peter did, Lord, save me. This is not a call to blindly ignore the challenges of life or to gloss over them with some spiritual pixie dust as if to say storms don't really happen. You know, you can have all the Christian cliches and the bumper stickers and the Christian t-shirts and the bracelets you want, but the fact of the matter is this, storms hit our lives. It rains on the just and the unjust. And in a moment you think not, all of a sudden the boat of our life is tossed about by waves and wind and rain that we didn't ask for and we didn't plan for. So we aren't just to oblivious, just to be oblivious to reality of storms in our lives. 
We just don't turn a blind eye to it. Rather, we need to counterbalance the storms with the long look of all of God's accomplishments. And just as the disciples in this instance forgot the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 that had just happened literally hours before, we too often forget all of the moments that the Lord saw us through and brought us out. We must do whatever it takes to keep our hearts surrendered and submitted to the Savior. The best laid plans need always start with, Lord, help me. Lord, save me. Lord, be with me. If we give in to our fears, our faith diminishes. But if we strengthen and exercise our faith, our fears will begin to diminish. All through our all through our Bible, we read of men and women who faced adversity, who faced fear, who faced the unexpected, who faced the unknown. I'm reminded of Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3. Jeremiah, he was depressed. There was political duress. The nation was in chaos and, and siege. Jerusalem was under siege. His body ached. In verse number 4, Jeremiah says that his flesh and his skin were wasting in his way and that his bones were broken. He blamed God for his physical and emotional state. He was in a rotten place. Life was falling apart. He felt shut off from God. He was crushed under the weight of it all. But he shifts his focus from the problems and onto the Lord. And with surrender, he calls out and reminds himself of the salvation of the Lord. And I want you to notice what Jeremiah writes in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21 through 24. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Think about it tonight. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. That's unconditional love. It never ends. His mercies never come to an end. His mercies are new each morning. Great is His faithfulness. The Lord is my inheritance. So in light of these things, Jeremiah says, I'm going to place my hope in Him. Lord, save me. I'm going to place my hope, my trust, my future. I'm placing everything into your hands. Lord, save me. You know, Jesus could have stopped the storm hours earlier. He went into the hills to pray. It wasn't as though he was oblivious that the storm was brewing out on the Sea of Galilee. He knew where his disciples were. He knew they were in that boat. He knew they were fighting. He knew right where they are, and he could have stopped the winds and the waves from a distance. Jesus started walking on the water toward them in the midst of the storm. And even then, he could have stopped the storm with one command of his voice, be still. Jesus allowed Peter to get out of the boat and start walking toward him. And at any moment, he could have stopped the storm and calmed the water, but he didn't. He had a lesson in mind that he wanted to teach Peter. He had a lesson in mind that he wanted to teach the disciples. And the same is true for us. Jesus knows that the storm that's been brewing in your life. He knows. He's, he's not caught off guard. He knows the pain you bear. He sees the tears that you cry. He knows the despair that you feel. And at any moment, he can stop the storm. But maybe, possibly, he is trying to teach us something. Maybe that storm, the storms in our life, God is using to focus us and point us in a new and unplanned direction in our life. And the storms of our life, they may be inevitable, 
but fear is always optional. And maybe he's trying to remind us and get us to believe that he really is right there with us, that he is present. Maybe he is trying to adjust our focus from everything going on in life to focusing on him, focusing on Jesus. And maybe he is waiting to simply hear from us those three powerful words that Peter uttered as he was sinking, Lord, save me. You know, just like Captain Kirk there in the Sea of Abaco, his awards, his certificates and license hanging on the wall of that 42-foot sloop in the Bahamas, God has displayed his certificates throughout the entire universe. The rainbow of promise, the rising and setting of the sun each day, the song of the birds, the change of the seasons, the rhythms of rest and work, God's accomplishments far outweighs the navigation of that sailboat in the open water, but he, and he specializes in far more important things than that. We're talking about credentials like the parting of the Red Sea. We're talking about credentials like dropping the giant Goliath with a stone and a sling from a little overlooked shepherd boy. We're talking about the closing of the lion's mouth, the cleansing of lepers, the opening of blinded eyes, the raising of Lazarus, and oh yes, the storm-stilling Son of God here in Matthew chapter 14. God is in control. God is present. And we can focus on Him and in surrender cry out, Lord, save me. And He will run to your rescue. I don't know where you are tonight in your life. Maybe you're in one of those moments where you're floating across the sea of your life and everything is smooth sailing. The sun is shining, you have perfect weather, calm waters, there's no wind, everything is beautiful and wonderful. And I say to that, to God be the glory, great things he has done, praise the Lord for you. But you may be watching and your life is the exact opposite of that. Your life is entangled and embroiled with the raging storm. And I don't know what that storm is, but you do. And right now as I'm talking, you are you, you can point your finger to the exact thing in your life that is creating anxiety and fear. It is creating despair and depression. You are worried. You're overthinking. And the winds are howling against your life. The enemy is smacking at you like the rains on the Sea of Galilee. And you don't know where to turn. Maybe you feel alone. Maybe you feel scared. I want you to remember tonight, Jesus is present. Jesus is present. If you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, he is present in your life. If you don't know him, you can know him even now. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe you are, are sitting there and your focus is on all of these other things going on in your life. All of the problems, all of the raging storms. And all you've got to do is focus your attention back on Jesus. And be willing to surrender your life. Surrender your desire to fight and show strength and fix everything. And just surrender to the Lord and say, Lord, save me. Lord, save Help me. Lord, be with me. And no matter where you are, no matter what you're going to do, I, I, I want you to remember these calm and assuring wor words of Jesus. Don't be afraid. I am here. I am here. Let's pray together. Father, thank you tonight that you are with us amid the storms of our life, amid the challenges and amid the obstacles, you are with us. And we can stay focused on you. And Lord, when we ask you to help us, you will. Father, I pray for those watching and listening tonight, wherever they may be, encourage their heart right now. Don't give up. Don't give in to discouragement. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. Keep on going. You are with us. 
And Lord, I pray for the needs of the people that may be watching tonight. Oh, how I pray that you will meet them even now according to your great riches and glory. May your strength be perfected in our weaknesses. God, may you get glory from our lives and of the response that we have to the storms that find their way into our life. Lord, I pray even now if there's someone watching that has never trusted you as personal Savior, that even now, even amidst the storm that may be going on in their life, they will cry out, Lord, save me. And we know, according to your word, that whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the powerful promise of your presence and your protection in our lives. How grateful we are. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for raising from the grave to be alive so that we may have life more abundantly, full and free. Thank you, God, for all you have done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.